There we go. Okay. Um, good. Now, there are two specific things you want to know for probability, two formulas. This one is the probability of A and B happening. That's a probability of A multiplied by the probability of B. And that kind of makes sense because and in math class means to multiply. Now, sometimes you ask for an or, right? Probability of A or B happening. Well, or means to add, right? Probability of A plus probability of B. But we got to be careful. We have to subtract if there's any overlap in there, right? So for example, this one right below has some overlap. A lot of reading. It's number 56. The question says, what is the probability that the selected card will be blue or 17? So I'm going to say probability of blue or 17. Well, that's going to equal the probability of blue plus the probability that you're 17, and then subtract the probability you are blue and 17. Okay, so this is kind of like an Uno deck here. There's 100 cards, um, there's five colors, and they're each numbered with an integer, and there are 20 of blue, red, yellow, and green, and orange, and they're numbered one through 20. Okay, probability of blue. Well, we're told there's 100 cards, right? Well, 20 of them are blue. Probability of 17, well, out of the 100 cards, I believe there's five, there's 17, right? There's a, a red one, there's a green one, an orange one, and so on. Now, the thing is, we counted the blue 17 twice, right? We counted the blue card that was 17 in the blues, and we also counted it in the 17s. So we have to make sure to subtract the overlap of those two. And when we do that, notice we get an answer that is not reduced, okay? So don't really get clued into this like, oh my gosh, I got to reduce everything. No, you don't. Here's a specific one that does not say you have to reduce it. But pay attention to this, right? Because um, notice the one right below that, 25 out of 100, I would bet that is probably a very common one that people have selected. So be careful, subtract the overlap. Um, here's another one. This one says, what is the probability that, now notice it's number 24. It's a lot earlier in, in the test, so it should be easier. Um, that A or B will occur. So probability that A or B. Well, it's the same thing as this, right? But they do tell us something. This word, mutually exclusive. Um, like when you're dating someone, you hopefully hope that they are mutually exclusive, right? Not dating anyone else while you're dating them. Same thing on this. A and B, there's no overlap between the two. One has nothing to affect the other. They are two total separate entities. So we are told the probability of A is 0.2. And the probability of B is 0.6. Add them up, we get 0.8. And they've got every other possibility covered in here. All right. Questions yet? All right, let's get to some more complicated probabilities. Let's look at this one, number 58, way, way late in the test. You got five balls numbered one through five and are placed in a bin and they pull out two at random. Notice, without replacement. What's the probability that the sum will be seven? Okay, I think we're gonna have to write out every possibility we have. And it, but it's only pulling them out two at a time. So we could pull out number one and then number two, one and then three, one and four, one and five. I think those are all the possibilities. We pick ball number one. If we pick ball number two, well, we've already picked it with one. So we'll pair it with three, four, and five. I think those are all the pairings we could do with two because we've already got the two paired with the one earlier. Now notice, it doesn't matter which one comes out first or second because it just says that their sum is seven, right? It doesn't matter if ball one comes out first or ball two comes out first. We're gonna count those as the same. And then we could pull out a three. They'll pair with a four and three compared with a five. Um, let's see, that's three. And then we could pull out a four. Four would pair with five. Okay, how many of those have a sum of seven? Well, I think that adds up to seven. And so does that. 
I think that's it. That's two out of 10. I look, I don't see it. So let's reduce it to be one fifth. I see it, it's right there. Okay. All right. Now these next two, now notice this one's number 59, right? Pretty complicated. This one, it's number 25. I think it's a stinker. I think it should be like in the 50s, really. So sometimes like in the first 30, there are a couple of stinkers in there that are tough. This number 25 is just like it. So let's look at um, 59 here. Suppose A is randomly selected from here and B is randomly selected from here. What is the probability that A times B is greater than zero? Well, remember, probability is favorable over total. So I should figure out the total amount first, right? Which would be how many A's times how many B's, right? Well, for A, I it said that A is from here, right? So there's one, two, three, four, five of those. And then for B's, there are one, two, three, four of those. So there's a total of 20 in the to 20 possibilities, right? Which I think we could safely get rid of A, right? Out of 200, no way. Now the rest of these could happen, right? There could be a reduced fraction in here. We wanna be careful. Now, the other thing is this, I wanna figure out when A times B is greater than zero. Well, that means A times B is positive, which I think would have to be, let's say we've got a negative times a negative. Well, a negative times a negative is a positive, isn't it? Well, how many negative A's are there? One, two, three. How many negative letter B's are there? One, two. All right, there's six of them. Also, couldn't it be a positive times a positive? Isn't a positive times a positive another positive? Um, there's only one of those in A. Now don't count the zero because anytime you multiply by zero, the answer is zero, not greater than zero, right? And then how many Bs are positive? Just one, one times one is one. So that totals to be seven. So the answer is seven out of 20. There it is. Now we could have written out the entire sample space much like we did over here in number 58, right? But this would have been a lot, right? There's like three, four, three, that we would have to write out 20 pieces. That would be a lot. This was kind of nice. And this is why this was number 59, a little bit of thinking involved on it. But if you were stressing for time, I think you probably could have eliminated these two and maybe gotten it down to B or D, maybe, you know, taking a chance that there might not be any reducing going on. Because we know it's gotta be a 20 in the denominator. Um, okay, now this one, I think this should have been number 60 on the test. I think it's ridiculous, it's number 25. It is a really rough one. And you need to use your calculator on this one. Now the question says, you know, we've got 12 red, right? So I got 12 red, 14 yellow, and eight green. All right. How many additional red marbles must be added to the 34 already there? So the probability of drawing a red marble is three fifths. Well, first of all, I'm not good with fractions. I like decimals better. So in my calculator, I would type in three divided by five and I would get 0. 0.6. Well, let's right now figure out what is the probability of drawing a red marble, right? Well, it's 12, right? There's 12 marbles total, 12 out of 34 total. Now, when we do that, we get 0. 0.35. Now we're supposed to get 0. 0.6, right? So we need to add a bunch of red marbles. Now, Here's the big one at ACT wants you to do. And in math class, we want you to set up a whole series of equations and figure it out. Please don't do that. Do you notice that these answers are in increasing order? Pretty much always the case. They're either getting larger or smaller. We're gonna do a technique called guessing and checking. I'm gonna guess number 29. Now here's what's the advantage of guessing 29 first. If I do 29 red marbles in there and the probability is gonna be too big, well, then I know that 34 and 44 are also too big, right? So by guessing one choice, we can narrow it down to a 50-50. So I'm going to try 29. 
So that means the probability of a red marble would be 12 plus, we're adding 29 red marbles, right? Now don't forget to add 29 red marbles to the total as well, right? We're adding 29 red marbles to this. Now, when I do this math, I get 0.65. I suppose to get 0.6. So 29, that's too many red marbles. Well, then so is 34 and so is 44. Well, now we're down to a 50-50, okay? And now we're talking. Now, this was really, really close to 0.6. So I'm going to go back and try 21 instead. So I'm going to try 21. So the probability of red is, now I'm writing this out for you, but I think when you're doing the ACT, I'm hoping you're not labeling stuff like this because it, it takes some time to do that. Um, probability of red. Well, we're going to go ahead and add 21 red marbles instead. And don't forget to add 21 to the total, right? When I do this math, I get 0.6. And that is the answer. Now, this question I have seen occur on three different ACTs. So it was a pretty popular one for a while. Any questions on probability before we go into um, our last like review topic before we get into the actual test? Okay, let's deal with area. Um, there are area formulas you have to know, right? Like the area of a parallelogram is base times height. Now notice, I put a lot of information on here. Like I put this as angle one and angle two. You should remember those two angles add up to be 180 degrees, right? Here's a rectangle area, then our formula for perimeter. Here's a triangle, right? Height and base. It's one half base times height. Now, sometimes I've seen a couple of questions. In fact, there was one on the July test from this summer that asks for it, and you had to use trigonometry to get it. And this is the formula for the trigonometry, okay? There are circles, right? Pi r squared for area and two pi r for circumference. And then trapezoid, right? There, we've got the two bases, base one and base two. Those are the two sides that are parallel to each other, okay? And um, the area is always one half of base one plus base two times h, right? Or what you could do instead is find the average of the bases times the height. Because isn't one half times base one plus base two, that's really the height. I mean, that's really the average. Same thing applies that I had up here. Um, if you were to add these two angles together, they should add up to be 180. I mean, I'm sorry, they should add, yeah, add up to be 180. And then this is something called the midline. A midline is something that if you connect midpoints, right? The midline is when you connect midpoints. And the midline is parallel to these two sides. There was one ACT question a couple of years ago to ask for the area, and they just said the midline. Now, the midline is the average of the two bases. So you could actually say, you know what? This also equals the midline times the height. And, and that was a formula you had to know. OK, I'm a big believer in drawing pictures as you do things. So this first one, it's number 17. Not too bad. What's the area of a, so the area of a square, I see the word square, I immediately draw a square. And it says the area is 36. I'm gonna put 36 on the inside. What's the perimeter? Well, remember all sides are the same on a square. So I think it has to be six and six, right? Because six times six is 36. Now be careful. You see the 12 there? A lot of times we just label two sides. We should label them all, right? Because when I add up all those things, I'm gonna get the correct answer of 24. So ju just be careful there. Um, number 23, what's the minimum number of square floor tiles? Each nine inches on a side, that could be used to cover a floor 15 feet long and six feet wide. Now notice these do not line up, do they? Feet and inches, we've gotta do some converting here. So the first thing I would do is draw a nice, large rectangle. And we know that it is six feet, right? And 15 feet. Well, what I better do is I better convert those to inches, right? Because aren't these tiles in inches, right? And we know that 12 inches equals one foot. So if I multiply this by 12, I'm going to get 72 inches. And then if I do the same 
for the other 15 times 12, I get 180 inches. All right, so here's what I would recommend. We know we're trying to put down a bunch of squares in here, right? Complete squares, no partial squares at all. I know a square is nine inches. Let's figure out how many squares tall this is. Well, if this is 72, 72 divided by nine would be eight squares. It's gonna take eight squares to go up and down on this rectangle. This is 180 long. If I divide that by nine inches, I'm going to get 20 squares going across. Well, eight times 20, 160. This is a pretty big stinker to be number 23. Um, should be later in the test. But I mean, we got in. So yeah, ACT is starting to do unit conversions. Nothing crazy though. It's usually like minutes and hours or seconds or feet and inches. That's about the extent of it. All right, here's one. Question says, what is the fractional part of the six by six inch square that is shaded? So how much of the square is shaded? Hmm. Well, what I could do is figure out how many little squares are in the full square, right? This is one, two, three, four, five. This is six by six. So there's 36 full squares. And I think so what I could do is find the area of each of these squares. Like this is two and three. So two times three is six. Take half is three. This triangle over here is six tall and it's one, two, three four across, so I'll do six times four is 24. Take half of that is 12. So I wind up with um, 15 out of 36, which if I look is not there, I better reduce it. I can use my calculator or just figure that three divides into both of those and I get five over 12. No, oh, I screwed something up here. Um, the side on the left should be four. Oh my four gosh, down. how embarrassing. One, two, three, sure enough, right there. Thank you. So two times four is eight. Half of eight is four, not three. So we have 16 out of 36, which is not here. So if I reduce that, I'll get, um, let's see, eight over 15, eight over 18, not there. Four over nine, we do have it. There are a lot of other ways to do it. Um, I've seen people counting these and trying to put them together. Um, some you could actually work with the white triangle instead. Like you could have broken it up into a trapezoid over here in white and a triangle in the white area. It's however it works for you. Okay, I think ACT really wanted it this way, but totally okay. All right, now this next one is, is merging up area with this. Like it says one square whose side length is X. So I'm gonna draw a square where the side length is X. And a second square has a side whose length is X minus two. So here's a second square and it is X minus two. Um, what expression below represents the sum of the areas? Well, the area of this square is just x squared, right? Well, the area of this, we've got to multiply those. There's a couple ways you could do it. You could do x minus two times another x minus two and use that four letter F word, FOIL, and multiply all that out, right? And we could add together this x squared from up here. When I put them together, I'm gonna to get two x squared minus four x plus four, right? But some people aren't very good with multiplying out a binomial. They just have some trouble with that, okay? If you're one of those people that has trouble, it's okay. We're gonna break this up and find the area. X times X is X squared. And there it is, right? X times X. This piece would be X times a negative two, which would be negative two X. This piece here would be negative two times X or negative two X. And if I put those together, negative two X and negative two X, there's our negative four X. And then negative two times negative two is a positive four. There's our positive four. And so if we combine those, we will get letter E. Well, yeah, that was a mixing of a, of a couple worlds there, geometry and algebra. Um, 
hopefully a lot of, I, I teach algebra and calculus and i know in algebra we, we kind of developed this idea for a while so people are really good and don't have to use it anymore okay number let's see how far do we got here yeah we just have these last two and we're going to pull out the act um question number 49 Man, it's a stinker. It's number 49. I go right to the question. What is the ratio of the area of the small circle to the large circle? Okay. Now they tell us the diameter of the large circle is 12. So, and it's right here. The whole thing is 12. So that would mean that this distance here would be six, right? Because this would be the radius of the uh, big circle, right? Would be six because the whole thing is 12. Now, the radius of the small circle would be three. Now, the mistake is a lot of people want to call it six, okay? So be careful with that. The radius is what we need because we're trying to do the areas of the circle, which is pi r squared. Well, we're trying to find the ratio of the area of the small circle, which would be nine pi, right? Because its radius is three to the big circle, which would be 36 pi. Um, I know the pi is canceled and nine over 36. I don't know since the pi is canceled, we should get rid of D and E because both of those have pi in them, right? They're not going to be one of the answers. Nine over 36 reduces to be one fourth. And there we go. Okay, that was a true number 49. That kind of makes sense at 49. You're going quickly along the test. I've seen a lot of people use the diameter instead of the radius, okay? So, and again, those area formulas, be, remember those. You wanna know those things for the test. Okay, last one we're gonna to do together here on this. Um, number 14, what is the area in square yards of the figure? Now we need to check uh, side lengths are given in yards. All right, so everything is in terms of yards. It's not like number 23 that we did earlier, where there were feet and inches and all this other stuff. They're all in yards. We need to find the area of this. A lot of ways to go about it. I might just draw a line right here and break it up into two rectangles and say, well, this rectangle here is just nine times 10, which is 90. Well, I'm gonna get rid of F and G because this little piece here has gotta be, it's gonna be something. The area is gonna be bigger than 90. This little piece here, if the whole thing's 11 and this is nine, I think that piece must be two, right? Because isn't nine and the two make the full 11? And so two times four is eight. This is eight. So it should be 98. All right. We're going to go through more of these as we go, just kind of, kind of like how Mr. Williams goes through um, grammar a little bit. And then you come, we're going to keep coming back to this. We're going to come back to the rest of this stuff over the next week, next, next four days. And um, we're gonna do pretty well here. I do want you to get out the ACT though. And we, again, we are dealing with, let's see here, right? We're dealing with the same test that Mr. Williams was using. I would like for you to, um, sort of apologize for our dog. I'm not sure why my daughter's not keeping him quiet. Um, can you all go to page number, it's number number 23 at the top. I want to look at number 31 at the bottom there. Okay, hang on a second. Okay. Um, now this one, it may scare a few people because it's trigonometry, right? But let me tell you, Things are drawn, there's, a, there's something I want you to remember. Things are drawn to scale on the ACT. Even though, I'm gonna show you the directions on the, on the math section here. Don't you turn, stay on that same page. They tell you some things here, right? I would never waste time reading these. But this first one, illustrated figures are not necessarily drawn to scale. When I first read that, that kind of scared me. It, it made me think like, so you're telling me you might have a picture like this and say that this angle right here is 90 degrees, even though it doesn't look like it's 90 degrees? No, no. It should say are not necessarily drawn to scale, but they usually are. Um, in fact, there's only been three times in the last 20 years where the ACT has not drawn something to scale. And you know what? They told you it wasn't drawn to scale. 
And if you have any, any um, brothers and sisters that are freshmen on the pre-ACT, the math section, one of the questions had something not drawn to scale. And you know what? They said, this picture is not drawn to scale. Well, this one is drawn to scale. And so what you can do is you can use like your bubble sheet as a ruler. We're trying to figure out what the question mark is. Now, only thing I know is that this distance right here is 10, right? So if I look at this, isn't this side AC, it's bigger than 10, is it not? Um, hmm, silly ACT. There's only one answer that's bigger than 10. Now, we, I will do the math with you to show you how to get it, but things are drawn to scale. We can use things and measure and say, okay, I know how long 10 is. A to C, that's bigger than 10. That's the only choice that's bigger than 10. And we can get it. And ACT sometimes wants you to do this on a couple questions, for sure. Now, let's say um, we're, we're going to go ahead and do the math on it, right? Which estimation is a math skill. If we're doing math, remember sine, right? And we're going to talk about trigonometry tomorrow. But it's good old SOHCAHTOA, it's one of our math lessons in, that, in the math book there. Um, but we're told that the sine is four fifths, right? Now, sine is opposite over hypotenuse. It's for angle C. And, and we're going to go into pretty good depth on this when we get to it tomorrow. But the sine of C is four fifths. Well, sine is opposite over hypotenuse. So from C, opposite is 10. And hypotenuse, hypotenuse is opposite the letter B, right? It's opposite the right angle. Call that X. Well. We could cross multiply and solve this. We get 50 equals 4x. If we divide both sides by four, we get 50 over four, which reduces to be 20 fifths. Now I tell you, drawing the scale way faster. We got it done like in five seconds compared to like 45 seconds to a minute. Um, so there's one drawn to scale question. Um, I do wanna look at one on the very next page. So this is question 31, right? I want us to all go to question number 32. This one here, it's also drawn to scale. They want us to know what's the measure of angle Q. Now, that one, hmm, Q might be tough, but let me tell you something. I'm going to trace this angle right here. This angle, 54 degrees. I'm going to trace it and put it right on top of this one. And it turns out it's exact. Oh my gosh, it's exactly the same. Well, this one's also 54. Now, we do know this because in geometry, they tell us these two sides are equal, right? And if two sides are equal, aren't the two base angles also equal because it's an isosceles triangle? But I did it because, you know, trace it. So I could use my test book when I could use like the back page of the test book when use it because that ACT paper, it is super, super thin. Just don't rip any paper. They, you, they did not allow you to rip your test up. But that back page of the ACT booklet, there's no writing on either side. Use it as a tracing material. Nothing wrong with that. Now in a triangle, all the angles have to add up to be 180, right? So 54 and 54 is 108. So if I subtract that from 180, I'm going to get 72, which is letter H. Okay. But drawn to scale, such a big deal. Um, and we could have eliminated a couple, we could have eliminated the 36 for sure, because this angle looks way bigger than 45 degrees. Okay. So that is um, drawn to scale. Um, I also, want you to look at number 52. Now, number 52 is on page 29 at the top, okay? There's another technique I want us to be aware of, and that's called, I always want you glancing at the answers and eliminating things, right? Now, we're gonna do that on this question. So I look at this, this line here has a positive slope. Well, all those with a positive slope, but the y-intercept is a negative three. Well, that means I can get rid of H, right? Because that y-intercept is a positive three. Um, we are shading above the line. So we must be greater than, 
This one's less than, so we get rid of it. We get rid of it. So now we're down to letter G or letter K. And now it's got to do slope, right? Now, the thing is, isn't the slope of a line, when we're at 45 degrees, that slope always equals one. Well, this looks like 45 degrees. And so I'm going to pick letter G to be the answer. Now, we could figure out the slope traditionally, right? Change in Y over change in X. And I could use right here, right? We're at negative three. I can go up three and then over three. So three over three is one. And it gets me to letter G also. But this glancing at the answers and eliminating, huge deal on the ACT because they're providing us answers to go with. So we're, we're doing a lot of things that really, they wouldn't be allowed in math class, you know? We'd want to see the work. All right, I need you to go now to number 40. Now, at the top of your booklet, it's on page 25, okay? Number 40. And just, just look at that. I mean, wow, a quadratic problem with absolute values? Um, this is one where we glance at the answers and we want to go ahead and plug numbers in and see which ones work. Now, I'll tell you, a lot of people want to plug in the number two and it's a waste of time because two works. You know how I know it works? It's in every single answer. So I know the number two is going to give us an answer of zero. Let's try out negative two. Let's see if that works. So absolute value of negative two squared minus that we get here. Um, the absolute value of negative two is a two and positive two squared is four. Um, we've got a minus sign I'm bringing down. Uh, the absolute value of negative two is two. So four minus two is a two and two minus two is zero. Yeah, negative two works. So I'm going to get rid of H because it does not have a negative two in it. I'm going to get rid of J. It doesn't have a negative two in it. And I'm going to get rid of that because it does not have a negative two in it. Well, I'm going to try another one out here. I'm going to try out negative one, see if that works, right? Because if it works, then it's K. And if it doesn't work, it's, it's G. So we'll try out a negative one. So the absolute value of negative one, an absolute value of negative one. Let's see what we get here. Um, the absolute value of negative one is one, and one squared is one. Bring down the minus sign. Uh, the absolute value of negative one is one and then minus two. Okay, one minus one is zero and zero take away two is negative two. It's not zero, so it's gotta be letter G. Now, there is a way to solve this quadratic with the absolute values, but please don't do that. It's gonna take you a long time. ACT, the, the deal is, it's got to be a minute or less on every question, and generally a lot less. Okay, so there was that one plugging in numbers. Um, oh, now here's another technique you've never learned before. If you could go to number four on page 28, okay, number 48. Now, this technique, it only works on this question here, but I have seen ACT tests that ask you things like this, like, five different questions on one ACT test. And this is a technique that works really well. It's called plugging in a number. We're gonna pick a number for X and see which one works. Now it says here, for every negative real value of X. So I need to pick a negative number. I'm gonna let X equal um, negative three. I try to stay away from, from twos and ones because like one to the third power is still a one, right? Just like one to the second. So I wanna be aware of those. I'm gonna try those out. So I'm gonna put negative three in here. Now the question says, all of the following statements are true, except for what? We have to find the one that's false, right? So X is negative three. Well, the absolute value of negative three is three. And I think three is greater than zero. That's true, so I can get rid of it. X is negative three. Two times negative three is negative six. Is negative six less than zero? Yeah, I think so. So it can't be that. Uh, negative three to the fifth power. Well, any number that's negative to an odd power is negative already. Yeah, that's true. Um, let's try this one. Negative, so it'd be negative three minus, okay, X squared. When I square this, I get nine. Negative three minus nine is negative 12, and that's definitely less than zero. Okay, it's probably the last one. Let's see. Um, 
absolute value of negative three is three. And then here's X, X is a negative three. Remember it's a negative three. So we have a negative, we have a minus a negative, which means plus um, the six equals zero. I don't think so. That's the one that's false. Now I know there's a way to reason your way through and kind of come up with them, but I have really found this. And we're gonna, we're gonna do this technique every single time these next four days. On this test, this is the only question that had it, right? But usually there's like two or three questions. Pick a value for X, plug it in and see which one works, okay? Okay, um, my favorite question on this test is number 58. If you could all turn to page 31 at the top, okay? 31 at the top there. Number 58. What's the area in square feet of the rectangle? Now I'm looking here and they tell us that it's two congruent trapezoids, whatever, there's an angle, everything is measured in feet. I'm gonna find the area, right? Well, I can do a little bit of stuff. I know the height is six, right? This distance is four. So that means this distance here is definitely more than four, right? Isn't six times four 24? Like the area is gonna be way bigger than 24. So I'm gonna get rid of these because those are not bigger than 24. Hmm. Students have a hard time with this one. Um, does anyone see, we wanna draw something. Does anyone uh, see it? Something we could draw to figure this one out? Ah, okay. Here it is. I see a 45 degree angle here. I'm like, how's that gonna help me? Well, I'm gonna draw this. Everyone go ahead and draw. It's called drawing an auxiliary line. We did one with the circles, right? Or we drew the radius. Students really don't like drawing auxiliary lines. I know how tall this is, this is six. And if that's 45 and this is 90, isn't this side also 45? And now you're like, hey, that's an isosceles triangle. These two angles are the same. If that's six, well then so is this one. And if that's four, so is this one. In fact, I could have gotten this side to be six if I would have drawn it carefully because I could have used my things that are drawn to scale idea and say, this is six. And I'm like, well, gosh, how long is that side? It's six, you know, I could use that. But see how long this side is now? It's 14. So 14 times six, let's see 24 is 84. The answer is letter K. But this auxiliary line, right? Drawing an auxiliary line, students have a hard time with that sometimes. So I wanted to be, have you be aware of that. Um, let's see here, we did that one already. Okay, now I wanna get into drawing pictures here. We're gonna try to stay in some geometry today. If you could go to number eight, it's, if you find page 17 at the top, okay, page 17 at the top, question number eight, there's, we're going to go through about six of these. Now it says a circular spinner, okay, I'm going to draw a circle. It's divided into six congruent sectors. Now the word congruent, that means everything is equal, right? I am not a really good drawer with this. So for, okay, imagine they're equal, right? They should be equal. I'm just not very good at drawing. You know, I could, I could do this. Hold on. I could do, I could do, here we go. All right, that, that's not much. Well, hold on. There we go. Okay. Draw the picture as best you can. The question says, what is the arc measure in degrees of each sector? This is a sector, a slice of pizza. Now this is a circle, right? And if I glance at the answers, I see degrees. And I'm like, I may have forgotten how to do this, but I should remember that in a circle, all, you know, it's 360 degrees around a circle. They wanna know how long is each arc? Well, there's six of them, right? Divide by six and we get 60 degrees, Ooh, letter J. Okay, um, let's go ahead and go to page 19. 
all the way at the bottom. Question number 16. And again, we're focusing on drawing the picture. It says the perimeter of a parallelogram. All right, I can draw a parallelogram. Yeah, opposite sides are parallel. It says, and the length of one side is 16. Well, I'm gonna say that this is 16. Well, if that's 16, isn't the other side also 16? Because it's a parallelogram, right? Now we are told that the perimeter is equal to 80, right? So if I were to um, take 16 and 16, which is 32, right? If I take 80 and subtract 32 from that, I'm gonna get 48. So that's what these two sides together are, right? Well, if they're both the same and they add up to be 48, I think each of them has to be 24. And we see the answer right there, letter H, 16, 24, 24. But by drawing the picture, it kind of helps us get into the problem a little bit more. We start seeing some things we might not necessarily see. Okay, let's go to um, number 23. It is on page 22 at the top. Okay, number 23. And again, I want us to draw the picture for this. The length of a rectangle. Okay, better draw a rectangle. Now the length is here and the width is here, right? The length is the longer piece. The length of a rectangle is 12 feet longer than the width. Now, if I glance at these answers, do you notice everything has a letter W in it? So let's call the width W. Well, that means the length has to be 12 plus W, right? Because it's 12 feet longer. Now it says the area of the rectangle is 140. Well, isn't area length times width? So wouldn't it be W times 12 plus W equals 140? And if we look at that, I think we see it as letter B. Okay, drawing the picture really helps us kind of see what's going on in this. Okay. Same page, number 26. The diameter of the circle is six feet. So I'm gonna take my circle and the diameter is six feet. So the radius must be three, right? It says, what's the area? Well, pi r squared, right? So pi times three squared or uh, nine pi. Letter H. Do you see that awful letter J? 36 pi, someone's gonna do six squared. I know it because they're gonna rush it. If you draw the circle, it kind of forces you to slow down just a little bit so you don't make those silly mistakes. Um, I always go through ACTs of questions that people miss. And right now I'm going through all the freshmen on their pre-ACT and there's so many silly, silly mistakes because they just went too fast. Draw the circle, it's gonna prevent you from making that error. Okay, if you flip the paper over and go to number 30, all right? It's on the very next page. This is one I want to draw also. Now, it says Javier will have a pool installed in his backyard. The interior pool is a right circular cylinder. Okay, well, that's like a can of soda, right? Pop, lemonade, whatever you want to call it. I'm going to go ahead and draw a cylinder. I'm not a very good artist, but oh, I've been doing it for a while. I'm going to label what it says. It says with a uniform depth of five feet. So that's how deep it is, right? This is a pool, five feet deep, and it's got a radius of eight feet. Okay. I am definitely not drawing this to scale because um, the depth looks bigger than eight, right? Okay. It says the maximum volume of water that can be in the pool is 75% of the volume of the pool. So they're not going to fill it all the way to the top. They're going to fill it pretty close, but not all the way up, 75% of it. Which of the following values is closest to the maximum number of cubic feet of water can be in the pool? Well, to find the volume of things, find the area of the base. The area of the base is a circle, isn't it? Pi r squared. And if I were to take this circle that's on the base and just stack them one on top of the other, right? Like, like here's my wife's um, dust cleaner. It's a circle on the base. And if I were to stack all those circles one on top of each other, I would have what this pool is, a much smaller version of it. But all it is is the area of the base times the height. 
So the area of the base times the height. Now, the base, so eight is the radius, so pi times eight squared times five. Now, if I look at it, do you see letter H? I'm sorry, not letter H. Um, well, that is the answer. Hold on a second. Um, it's going to be filled to 75% of it, right? So I'm going to multiply all of this by 0.75, and that's letter H. Uh, no, it's not H. What, what is H missing? I, I. I, right? And it's missing like a bunch of other stuff, like an eight squared, right? So I should look at this. I think it's letter F, right? 75 pi eight, yeah, it's letter F. So this is one of those like attention to detail, right? Be careful, don't make a mistake I just did. That's pretty terrible. Um, but again, glancing at the answers, I'm not gonna compute this. I'm just gonna look and see which one is the same one that I'm looking for. Okay, so it's 30. Now let's get to 36. It's on page 24, all the way at the bottom. Okay. Okay. Now it says the measures of it says the measures of four interior angles of a pentagon. A pentagon means you have five sides, right? So I'm just going to draw one, two three, four. I just drew a, a crazy looking pentagon. And they're telling us what all the angles are, right? And we have to figure out what the fifth angle is. Um, you may not remember the formula. In fact, I'm pretty guaranteed very few people do remember the formula. But if you take a vertex and start drawing to opposite vertices, right? We get triangles. Everyone is able to remember that a triangle has 100 80 degrees, right? And if I were to add those up, three times 180, right? Because there's three of those, that is exactly 540. All the angles inside should have to be 540. So if I subtract these angles from 540, I get the answer, which is letter K, 125. Okay, we have eight minutes remaining. So I wanna kind of go back. Generally, we're gonna um, do some timing on this. Like I'll do like the first, you know, 20 questions in 15 minutes to kind of do some timing, um, but not today. Today, I'm just trying to get a lot of like techniques in you to help you remember. Um, if you all can go to page 18 at the top and look at number 10. Now matrices, are on about every other test, okay? It's like one question. You never know how it's gonna look like it. And I'm, chances are, unless you're in college algebra or pre-calculus, um, you haven't done anything with matrices yet. Well, see how we've got a two on the outside of that matrix and a three on the outside of this? Anytime we have something like that, I would think distributive property. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna go ahead and distribute that two to every single number in that matrix. So two, six, and then four, and an eight, right? I just multiplied everything in that matrix by a two, just doing distributive property. I'll do the same thing on the other matrix, but distributing a three instead. Okay. And now I'm gonna add these two matrices together. So when you add a matrix, imagine taking one matrix here, and putting it right on top of the other one. Do you see how this two would add up with the six to make an eight in that spot? So I'm gonna get rid of J and K because those do not have an eight in that top corner. If I look at the bottom corner here, six would be right on top of the negative three. Well, six plus a negative three is three. Ah, uh, that's the only one, letter G. That's the only one that it would be. Okay. Um, there's one, it's like, so number 47, right? It's, um, if you go to page 27 at the top, right? Number 47. I don't think this is a terribly 
hard a question to be here. Um, but, oh well. In the standard coordinate system, which of the following lines is perpendicular to this line? Now, perpendicular, you should remember, that means that when the lines intersect, they form a right angle, right? It also means that if, let's say, one has a slope of two-thirds, wouldn't the other have to have a slope of negative three halves? Perpendicular, right? They're opposite reciprocals. So I need to find the slope of this one. So I'm going to divide everything by three. So I've got y equals four thirds x plus two thirds. Now the slope here is four thirds. So the perpendicular slope should be negative three fourths. Because again, they've got to be opposite reciprocals. And there's only one of those with it, letter B. That's it. Okay. Um, Directly, we're going to go till 8.30 here, and then we're going to switch and do some reading. Um, but if you go right above that number 46, it does say when graphed, so we could graph these, but I'd rather you not. When graphed, this line and this line intersect at what point? Well, it's already telling you that x equals a negative 3, right? So let's get rid of f and g, because those x values are not negative 3. Now, if x is a negative 3, couldn't we put that in for the x? This x here is, it's a negative three, right? So y would have to equal a negative eight, which is letter K. Okay. Um, turn the page and let's look at number 49. 49 all comes down to, do you know the formula, right? They want to know what's the area of A, B, C, D, A, B, C. This is a trapezoid. We are told it is a trapezoid. So we need to remember the formula for a trapezoid is one half times base one plus base two times the height. There's a lot of ways to write it out, but that's what we'll use. We're told A, B is eight. So this distance here is eight. Well, that's one of the bases. Um, CD is 12, CD is 12, that's the other base, and EF is six, that's the height. Well, shoot, all we gotta do is plug this stuff in. So eight plus 12 times six. Plug it in your calculator, you get an answer of letter A, 60. Pretty amazing, that's number 49. And again, I, those last 20 are supposed to be the really tough ones, but sometimes there's some nice gifts that are left in there for you. Um, let's go ahead and finish off with number 53. It is a probability question. Now, I've kind of tried to stay away from the probability ones in this packet because we did spend some time doing probability. But here we go. A box contains six identically sized solid colored balls. One ball is green, so we have one green. Two are yellow. Three are red. A ball is drawn at random and returned to the box. Okay, so we pull a ball in and then we put it right back in the box. Then a second ball is drawn at random. What's the probability that the first ball is red? The probability of first ball is red and the second ball is green. Well, remember in our notes, the probability, right? I'll pull it up here for you to see. The and, right? Probability of A and B. It's probability of A times the probability of B. Well, probability of red times the probability of green. Well, the probability of red is three out of six. And then we put the red ball back in and the probability of green is one out of six because we put the ball back. So the answer is three out of 36, which I don't see, but if we reduce it, we get one twelfth. There we go.